you for persuading the weather gods to make no wind, no rain, no 28 degrees. This is amazing. <laughs> it is amazing. So, um, introductions. I'm Sarah Martin, and I'm Linda Pirelli. And uh, we thought we would open the evening by talking to you a little bit about our own personal experience with why it is that we're incorporating the life that we're incorporating and the work that we're doing with courses. And, um, and then go ahead and we'll actually go through um, the process of the seven games and we'll be talking about um, the different functions. So you, you've um, all gotten a handout, I hope, that has um, the perspective from me um, on one sheet and the perspective from Linda on another, which you can see ends up being fairly similar. And you. So it's both of us on that one. Okay. And um, at any rate, that's what we're going to be talking about tonight, is everything you've got on that sheet. And um, we do have that now electronically, so if you go home and you have a friend who wants it and you can't copy it, just let us know and we can email it to them. <laughs> So, um, and then horse-wise, we, we need to make these introductions. Our idea was to bring a horse who is just starting in the seven games so that we could um, keep this horse, I'll let Courtney talk more about it, but um, he has a strong riding background, but not a very strong seven games background. And then we have Jazz, who has, of course, both a strong seven games background and um, strong riding background. Courtney, I'm going to come stand next to you just so we can hear you and we can talk a little bit about this. Um, I'm just going to mention, I was down at the trainers <coughs> conference in Wellington um, at the beginning of the week for a couple of days, and um, Janet Foy, who's a well-known dressage judge, was giving a presentation on the young horse classes, the four, five, and six-year-old. And um, she said to the group of judges that were assembled, you know, dressage horses are the best trained and the least broke horses you ever <laughs> <want to> be. <laughs> and I thought, oh, I love that. I'm going to use it. <laughs> so, so will you tell us a little bit about this beautiful boy? Sure. So this is Donnie. He's a 12-year-old Andalusian gelding. Um, he's been at the Pirelli Center for three weeks now, so not too long. And he is trained in all the Grand Prix movements, but he can't put them together. So he knows how to do each individual one, but when you put them together, he gets really tense and worried and then just tries to run away or kind of explode. So that's why he's um, here with us to see if we can help with some of those emotional issues and tension. And he's already made a lot of progress through the seven games, which you'll hopefully see today on the ground um, and riding. We're not ready to do it riding today, but it's already helped him uh, mentally, emotionally, and physically, but then he still has quite a ways to go. It's sort of our life story, that quite a ways to go. <laughs> it's job security. <laughs> so, um, the way that I backed into learning about the seven games, um, a lot of you already know my backstory that I, I'm a dressage trainer. I got absorbed completely. I grew up doing all kinds of horse stuff, but got absorbed by dressage when I was about 24 years old. Decided that was what I wanted to learn the most about and started to really focus on it. Um, I was fortunate enough to train um, a number of horses up through Grand Prix and um, found a, a horse that I could compete in Grand Prix and, and go ahead and get my medals. So I was able to accomplish all of that when I was in my 30s. And, and I thought, wow, this is pretty easy. Like, you, you get a horse and you train it and you pay attention and, and you make a Grand Prix horse and then you do that again and then you do it again and after the third horse it just didn't happen anymore. And a lot of that is because of all the dynamics that happen around horses. Horses go lame, horses get sick, horses die, people leave the barn, whatever, whatever. But um, 
I, I had a course that I was very excited about, and all the very basic things I knew weren't working. And I was fortunate enough to meet Pete Rhoda, who had been at the Pirelli Ranch for six and a half years, I think, at that point. And um, he broke the news to me that the horse that I was having trouble with, that you know, wasn't really understanding how to be in the show ring and how to be ridden, didn't like me and didn't want me coming close to her. I was too close too soon. And that was kind of a hard pill for me to swallow, but I swallowed it because I knew that what I'd been doing wasn't working. So um, I, I listened. And I got to admit, it was tough. It was tough to, to listen to that and to go, oh, you know, all these world-class people and Olympic people and et cetera, et cetera, in the dressage world have been trying to help me, but they're not getting to what I need. And Pete did. And so through Pete, I met Linda, and, um, and I got introduced to this process of the seven games, and, and Pete has um, some exercises that he does with the horses that get them even ready for the seven games. So what that allowed me to see is what I said to Pete, it's the space between the words. It's like, oh, when you're, when you're working with a horse, you can, this process is giving them breathing room. And it's true, when we make a Grand Prix course, we are layering aids and layering aids. I think of it like a, a keyboard that starts out sort of like elementary school. There's a one, a two, a three, and a four, and you get to push those big squares, and then it gets divided, and you have more things in that same space, and more ways to create a movement, et cetera. And by the time it gets to Grand Prix, that same space has about a hundred squares, and the different combinations of those squares is what creates the Grand Prix course. So frequently in my training, um, I was told that I was too slow. You know, like, you're, you're too slow, you've got to be quicker, because this is not easy. You're going from movement to movement on a, on a tightrope, as it were, and um, your reactions have to be very sensitive. They have to be really, really on the surface, and you do have to be quick. You don't have time to study what you're feeling. You've got to get really good at feeling what you're feeling and responding and moving on. But um, what it made me realize as I worked with Pete is that I had gotten so sucked into that state that I didn't know how to not be in that state anymore. And for a horse, that is a state that you can definitely bring them to, but they would like to come off of it. <laughs> and what was so beautiful about the seven games is that it gave me a way to start to um, observe and discipline myself to learn how to come off um, what I think of as my New York City high. That, uh, that I was living with and, and get a little calmer. And what I loved was what I saw happening in the horses was exactly what I wanted to see happen in them as a dressage horse. I wanted to see their necks come out and let get longer. I wanted to see their back come up. I wanted, them, I wanted to be able to see them um, operate their legs individually, not the whole horse as a block. And, and I just kept saying, Pete, did, did the Pirellis do dressage? Do they, do they understand what they're doing here? So, <laughs> uh, 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 and when I met Linda, of course, I had to go right up to her and say, what you do is amazing. And, and do you understand what it is that you're doing? And she's kind of like, <laughs> but I've hounded her for years. And, um, and through riding together and, and discussion and um, so on, we have been able to exchange the information about the, the tremendous value that this work can give. And it can give not only to a young horse starting, but to an older horse who would appreciate the break and would appreciate a little bit of space between the words. And um, it allows them to find their way 
to balance and relaxation in their body again. So, um, so for me, everything about it was dressage. It's the training that we do, the ultimate ideal of what we do when we're training dressage courses, and what a lovely thing to be able to work on your relationship with your horse and the relaxation with the horse um, in a way that makes sense, but also gymnasticizes and supples and builds the relationship. So um, one of the things on the sheet of paper that um, I handed out, it, it doesn't have the chart, it's just all the writing, um, my apologies. But what, the reason that I put that down, I have a definition in there from the FBI on the definition of dressage. And when you read through it, I, I just think it's remarkable how often it mentions harmony, balance, communication, connection, um, the natural ability. And one of the things that saddens me in this world of people being in their little camps is it's the same language. It's very much the same language. And um, might be different clothes, but it's the same language. And so for the welfare of the horse, for the benefit of the horse, I said to Linda, can we please do this and, and talk about how this really is the same language. And it's, um, it really does support and benefit the horse and the human, me, in <laughs> um, understanding it. So, so that's my story. Sorry, it's a long one. Linda, you get to tell yours. Yeah, well, I'm not going to tell my whole glory story. That <laughs> takes a while. But um, in 1989, I was having a lot of trouble with my horses um, trying to do dressage. Basically, I was trying to do dressage, and they were trying not to. And one of them was putting a lot of effort into what I thought was fighting me. And so people were telling me, you know, to get stronger with him and to discipline him. But if ever I did that, he went nuts. And he was crazy anyway, you know, just even without doing that. And um, I tried all kinds of things and finally saw a video of Pat Pirelli riding a horse without a bridle. And I had no idea who it was. I was in my dressage outfit watching this video in a tax store where I was a very good customer. I had all the bits, all the party scales and drawings. I mean, you name it, I had it out of that store. And I still couldn't control my horse. And I saw this guy stopping his horse with no bridle. And I thought, you know, cowboy or not, I've got something to learn. Because if he can stop his horse from, you know, a dead run and slide 20, 30 feet, maybe I can stop my horse at X from a trot with $300 worth of stuff on its head, you know. And so I, uh, I turned up to the seminar. I had the worst horse there. Um, I had a near-death experience. I had lots of embarrassing moments. But when I um, walked in, or I should say I was dragged in by my horse, and he was body slamming everybody, you know, Pat said, if I could just stand him on the end and let me talk to each of you about your horse. And everyone's going, you know, oh, my horse is perfect except, and I've made a list of like two pages of what's wrong with my horse. And right before he got to me, this lady said, well, my horse is perfect except, sometimes I can't catch the horse. And Pat looked at her and said something that it just blew my mind. And he said, well, have you ever looked at this from the horse's point of view? And she went, what? And I went, oh, I never, it never even occurred to me. And he said, well, you know, let me put it this way. Um, if, you, if your husband was hard to catch, like you walked in the front door and he ran out the back door, would you go, geez, that guy's hard to catch. Or would you say, oh, I wonder if there's something wrong with the relationship? <laughs> so he said, that's what you have. You have a relationship problem. You don't have a horse that's hard to catch. And then he talked about prey animals and predators, which most of us know about these days. But in 89, it was like, oh, I've never even heard of that. And so um, he came to me, and I'd, I'd already learned more in you know, two minutes than I had in three years of dressage lessons and even having them five days a week. And that's not against dressage, but I was not learning what I needed to know to have a positive relationship with this horse. And um, so, you know, I said, well, uh, I've got some problems. And he said, uh-huh. <laughs> Watched me try to leave my horse in and couldn't stand still. 
And um, I said, I'm here to learn as much as I can. And so he said, well, the first thing that we've got to do is break down the prey predator barrier. He said, your horse doesn't trust you. And for some of you others, your horse trusts you, but they don't respect you. So they don't move when you ask them to. So he said, I'm going to show you how to balance trust and respect. Because without that, you've got nothing. You know, you've either got a horse that does everything for carrots and nothing when you really want to, or you have a horse that's fighting you the whole time and doesn't like you, okay? So um, he showed us these seven games, and at the time they were called six yields, plus, you know, something to break down the prey predator barrier. And it changed my life, as you can see, in more ways than one. But it was unbelievable, the change in my horse by lunchtime. And I know if you'd interviewed my horse, he would have said, well, it took that cowboy all day, but finally, he got her to see the light, right? So the horse was fine till I showed up. So he said to me, you know, I know you're really interested in dressage and you're passionate about it, but he said, dressage is a very sophisticated language of course. And he said, it's very refined. And he said, you have nothing to refine. <laughs> he said, your horse is leaping around, jumping, scared of you, scared of stuff. He said, you can't do dressage with that. It's like taking somebody, you know, that doesn't even speak English and trying to have a conversation with them. And then you start smacking them around because they don't answer you. And that's what happens. He said, these horses aren't stupid or deaf. He said, they don't know what the hell you're saying. And he said, the problem with humans is that we speak words. Whoa, whoa, quit, quit. In Australia, we go, we have something just as effective in Australia. Stand <laughs> off. And the horses are like, you know, now you're growling at me. It sounds like a predator. And, you know, like, but I love my horse. And the horse is like, you're a wolf in sheep's clothing. <laughs> I have no idea about this. And he said, so what you need to learn is the language of horses. You need to communicate with your horse. Because when you can communicate, you can teach him anything. You just need to know then what you're doing, right? So that's what he did. He taught us the ABCs of the horse language. And um, in 91, he said, I know what I'm going to call this. I'm going to call it the seven games. And I said to him, you can't call it games. Like, this is serious horsemanship. <laughs> and he just rolled his eyes at me. He's like, she's never going to get it, right? <laughs> But I finally got to understand what he meant by calling it a game. He was so far ahead of us thinking-wise. And he said, unless it's a game, the horse doesn't understand what the goal is. You'll just have a puppet. You'll just tell him, put your foot here, do this, do that. And he can't think. But when you make it a game, it's like a game of cards, a game of tag, a game of soccer or anything. There's goals, and both teams know the goal. And that's what we need to have with our horses. We need language, and then we need goal. And when you've got that, you can do anything. So um, what I want to show you in my part tonight is how these seven games work to get to the mind of the horse. Because when we talk about psychology, like that's Pat, when he first started traveling around, he was the horse psychologist. And you can just keep it. He was getting right. You're a horse psychologist, so what do you do? Lay your horse on the couch and ask him about his mother? You know, you know all this kind of teasing. But really what psychology means is the mind. Can you get to the horse's mind? So as an example, I'm standing here and I'm not controlling my horse physically. But I have his mind and his heart with me. And he's going, I know what to do. If you stand still, I stand still. If you get into action and we start doing stuff, then I'll get into action and do that. Even just having this after that first clinic with Pat was nirvana. <laughs> because I never had that. Everything was always a wrestling match. And I didn't know how to teach my horse how to be a partner. So the language is what the seven games is. And, you know, when I um, started doing these things, when I went back after the clinic, I mean, I got horribly ridiculed. And, um, you know, I'd be doing things and wiggling ropes and, you know, being a klutz, because I just learned this five minutes ago. And people would go, what's that got to do with dress art? That looks stupid. And I tried to go, well, it's a language, and I'm learning how to communicate. And I'm, that's stupid, you know. Well, about a year later, I could do some pretty cool things with my horse. And I, I was still getting ridiculed. What's that got to do with dress art? And I would still try to find a way to explain. And then one day, I learned how to lead my horse backwards by the tail. And I, I just felt like Rocky at the top of the stairs, you know, just unbelievable. <laughs> this is my bolting horse. And now I can lead him backwards by the tail. 
And somebody walked past and said, oh, that's pretty cool, but what's that got to do with dressage? And I went, I don't care. <laughs> that's pretty darn cool. <laughs> now, I might not need to leave my horse backwards doing dressage, but if I can communicate with him at that level, have that sophisticated a language, then I, I can teach him everything. Because he trusts me, he understands me, he respects me. And that's what the seven games is. So it's not competition to dressage. In fact, when I started doing the seven games, I had to hide behind the bushes because everybody gave me so much trouble. And my instructor did as well. She told me I was gonna ruin my horse with this Western stuff. And so I hid behind the bushes and did my seven games. And my horse started to improve quite dramatically to the point that two months later, my dressage scores went up by 10%. I was always in the mid 50s in my first level dressage. And two months after starting this, I was in the mid 60s. And the biggest thing that changed was my horse started wanting to be with me. And he understood what I was asking instead of just being pushed and forced and didn't understand what I wanted. So I knew that was going to be my path. And then in 1993, Pat called me, because I opened an office for him in Australia. And he called me and he said, will you come over and help me change the world? And I said, yes. I had no idea what it would take. But I said, yes, I've got to share this. And you know, we talk about this as the language with which to communicate. And it doesn't matter what you want to do. What discipline, to what level, English, Western, trail, polo, racing, doesn't matter. Even if it's an equine, an equid, then this works. And actually it works with other prey animals too. We, we get all kinds of interesting letters with people training prey mantises and all kinds of things. <laughs> so, um, what I want to, to share tonight is the mental emotional side of the games, how it works as a language. And then um, what Sarah will do is talk about how this applies to the gymnastic training of the dressage horse. So between us, we've got it all covered, mental emotional <laughs> and physical. And of course, any naysayer can go, yeah, they're only on the ground. But um, we have to start somewhere. And, and I am going to get on it this time. Oh, good. Yeah, I'm going to. Because that's what they do, is like, you ever going to ride that horse? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's, that's something that I was going to touch on, and, and I say also in that uh, flyer that you have, is that uh, to me, the seven games are very much like the elements on the training scale. There, there are individual aspects, and they are also related. And it's not something that you figure you have to be able to do, or that you will be able to do in a day. It, it takes time. And um, one of the biggest resistances for me, and, and it's so embarrassing to say it, but I would say to Pete, this horse has to get to Grand Prix, and you've had me out here for two hours. I've wasted two hours of my life waiting for Godot, right? I got, this horse has a job and a future, and you know, and he put up with me, which is just amazing to me. And I'm, grateful that he did, but um, there is some lead time, especially when you've screwed them up first like I did, and then, um, but as you get the understanding of what it is you're doing and what you're looking for, you layer it. So you layer the work with what you know, with your riding, with whatever, and um, it can, it's all degrees, isn't it? There's, there are degrees of understanding from the horse. There's degrees of rudeness as we are developing a horse. And my logic with the horse is I'm, I'm in it for life. I'm with that horse. It's not going anywhere. It's with me for whatever period of time we have, and I want it to be the best quality possible. So um, giving them a little bit of time on the ground has given me so much more quality in the saddle. It's just been unbelievable. And, and that's what basically turned the dial for me, is I, I kept feeling how these horses that used to be anxious, that you would ride and ride and ride and ride and ride to try to get them focused, could be given an equivalent amount of time on the ground doing something which might not seem like much, and then all of a sudden, their whole body and mind was there for the taking. And, um, and that's what's lovely. And that's why we thought it might be fun to have 
a younger as well as a very experienced horse and, um, and do a little bit of comparing and contrasting. And so, as Linda said, she'll demo and she'll talk a little bit about each game as, she, as we move through it. And then I'll just point out to you when she's done what it is that I see that resonates from a dressage base. What's happening in the body, what's happening gymnastically that, that just is so invaluable for when you do go. So I think it's important to say here that I'm a student of dressage. That's not my area of expertise, it's my passion. And, uh, but I have reached a level of mastery with what we do with um, horse psychology. And uh, so and this is Jazz. Uh, he's a 12 year old older bird. I've had him since he was a baby. And um, he came to my barn. He was at my husband's uh, court starting park uh, before he came to me. And he came to me just before he turned four. And I'm, I usually have horses that have a lot of baggage <laughs> that, um, you know, being the hell and back through, you know, training issues and things like that. And this is the only horse that I've had since the beginning that has never had any baggage. And yet he's the most challenging horse I've ever had to train. <laughs> he's very high spirited, sensitive, introverted. You know, an introvert is a horse that kind of runs away on the inside and freezes and gets tense. And he's only just coming down off adrenaline. Yes, what you saw for the last 20 minutes was him on adrenaline, right? Frozen, like this. And finally, he let go and started to make his eyes and his lips and and I, I trained with um, Christoph Hess once a year, and, and we did a, a DVD together, and he asked me, we, there were a whole bunch of um, riders, and there was horses like leaping through the air. And Jazz was standing here like this, and he said, what do you like about Jazz? And I said, well, I like that you know, he's kind of hot and he's sensitive, and he's standing there like this, and others are flying through the air. And I could just see Christoph's face, it's like, that girl needs to get out. <laughs> she doesn't know what a hot horse is. But it's interesting, you know, he's been very challenging because of that tension and that introversion. So I've had to really explore that, you know, as I um, develop my, my um, training going through the levels, uh, you know, of dressage. And we're at fourth level now and venturing into pre-St. George and I still feel like I don't know anything. So, so um, let's start with the friendly game, hey? Mm -hmm. So the friendly game, uh, and you've got notes, there'll be a test later, but you've got them there if you want to. <laughs> Step into it. But the friendly game is the first game and the most important game because of our prey predator relationship. So it's natural for horses to be suspicious of people because we're predators. We act like predators and we smell like predators. And even if we're a nice person and we love our horse and uh, we're vegetarian, they can still be terrified of us because of the way we behave. When we're scared, when we're mad, we tend to force, we're direct line, and horses are completely the opposite of that. So usually we have to do the opposite of what we think we need to do, because horses need the opposite. So friendly game, the goal of it, as you see on that paper, is to relax. So if my horse is standing still but he's not relaxed, then I haven't won the friendly game. I've got to do whatever it takes to get that horse to where he's relaxed. And you know, we do all kinds of things because we uh, go up our levels of horsemanship, you know, to the point where you can do things that are pretty, you know, firm that most horses, you know, could not deal with. Like, do you know a horse, not yours, that maybe you couldn't do this with? Right? But you wouldn't start here. Does that make sense? So I need him to trust me in the most vulnerable places of his body, you know under his tail, in his flanks, in his sheath, in his ears, his mouth, all the sensitive areas, this horse is going to go, yeah, that's fine. Because a lot of people, you know, they can do Grand Prix and not be able to touch a horse's ear or need three people to hold on to him to get on. There's something wrong with that, right? If you have to lead an athlete to the starting blocks with a chain over their nose, there's something wrong. Like these horses are not relaxed, they've got to be confident in their area. So that's what we do with the friendly game, and there's lots of ways to do it. And you know, obviously it starts on the ground, and then I'll show you that when we're riding as well. But it's kind of like giving and backing off and re-approaching re is the most important thing. Whereas humans, when horses have trouble, we tend to do more. And we actually think that I find myself um, teaching 
my writers as they're working their way up the level, is you keep doing less. You keep doing less. And we all remember what it was like to learn to ride, to learn to post, and to recruit all those muscles. And, and then we think, okay, well, so if it was that hard to do something that simple, now it must get really hard. I mean, that's the subconscious part of the brain going after you, work harder. And instead, what you become a master of as a, as a good rider is the ability to focus on your balance, know where your balance is, and make very precise aids. And um, the big thing about friendly game, I find, is the horses learn um, what to ignore. That, that something can yeah. be moving, you can have a flag, you can have a tablecloth, you can have whatever, and, and if it doesn't mean anything to them, if it's not being reinforced with an aid, then they're like, oh, I, I don't have to worry about that, right? And um, the most important thing is that they feel safe and relaxed with us, because even if we get into another situation, <coughs> it's like they got to go, oh, you're here and you're relaxed, so therefore I'm okay, you know, rather than, oh my god, this is crazy, I've got to get out of here, forget yeah. you. You're no good to me, you're not my safety. Right? So the friendly game really takes that relationship to a whole other level. And then they learn it when you're on their back. So that that same feeling and that same respect, yeah. it, you might not be in the line of sight, but you're there and that connection is there. Yeah. The other thing that I run into a lot um, in my conversation with dressage riders is, um, and this particularly happens with FBI riders, where they say, I, my Grand Prix horse doesn't need to be relaxed. And the fact of the matter is, you, you can't make a tense muscle supple. It's, I mean, it's just physiologic, it's easy. Yeah, you do have to have relaxation. And again, that's where it's a matter of degree, right? It doesn't mean he has to be like this in the Grand Prix test. But <laughs> if he can be like this, before that test starts, his stomach's going to be healthier, his muscles are going to be soft and receptive, and he's going to be able to life up and move from a supple place, not a tense place. So it is necessary. It doesn't mean this is the end point. It's no. the beginning. And that's a big problem for a lot of people. We get this also with the race horse crowd. They go, but if they're relaxed, they won't be fast. You have to be a nervous wreck to be fast. You have to run the race before the race happens, right? Because you can be so keyed up. And it's amazing how many horses are sick because of stress. Mm -hmm. And so having something where you can go and relax, we're good. That's a hugely important button. But relax does not mean asleep. Right? I mean, I'm relaxed, mm -hmm. but I'm alive and talking and you know ready to do things, and I'm excited. But it's a positive excitement. It's not a no, no worry. When the horse is worried, he's not in a learning or a performing friendly mind. So friendly game can really help with that. Yeah. And it can get carried in. And all kinds of, there's a lot of things to think about friendly game as a bucket that go in that bucket. Um, grooming, catching, clipping, uh, deworming, veterinary work, shoeing. They're all in that friendly game bucket. Relax, this is not something we're doing to you. It's something that we're doing same thing with saddling and mounting and bridling, and that's all friendly game. So that, that enables horses to start to discern between activity that they should pay attention to and activity that they yeah. can ignore or relax around. And that brings you right in to the next game, which Porcupine Game starts to help horses interpret aids. So by going through the, the process, and, and Linda will talk about that, but again, when I spoke to you about that keyboard where we have all these um, blocks that are getting smaller and smaller, you have to be able to have a horse who can understand when do I pay attention and when do I not. So if I'm sitting on a horse and I'm cantering and I want to set him up for a flying change, I'm going to be utilizing aids that feel like canter. And then I'm going to be getting him in a position that he darn well knows 
means change. But the well-trained horse waits. And then when he gets the precise aid at the precise time, the final change happens. And this is all part of what starts to happen with porcupine game, is they start getting different degrees of aid and influence. And it enables them to discern these different levels of touch, but also to separate their body parts according to the part that you're talking to. Just as a rein aid can talk to the front of the horse, and a leg aid can talk to the rear of the horse, and your seat can talk to the back of the horse, um, these exercises help the horse start to be able to isolate parts of his body, as well as unify parts of his body for the answer. So this is the game of steady pressure, and the first three games are your alphabet, because you have relaxation and no pressure, that's what the friendly game is, and then you have steady pressure and rhythmic pressure. So this is the game of steady pressure, and most of our aids involve steady pressure. Rain, leg, seat, right? That's all kind of steady pressure. There's sometimes you're going to use rhythmic pressure, but most of it is steady. And most horses don't understand pressure. They fight against it, and that's natural for them. We have to teach them what it means and what the appropriate response to pressure is. So, you know, having a horse that's light to the touch like this, can you imagine what that feels like to ride? Try it and you'll see it after. If I, you know, touch him with my leg or my hands or whatever, that he's going to have this thought about following the feel instead of resisting it, right? It's like butter. It's beautiful, and it should feel like a, a rubber ducky in your bathtub. You know, remember the. So that's what it should feel like. But most horses don't feel like that. It feels like pushing that wall, and that's what my horse was like the first time I went to that clinic. You know, Pat's in there putting hands on the horse's nose and back him up, and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> couldn't move him because you know they want to brace against pressure and push against pressure. So you've got to teach them the appropriate response in every part of their body, that there's no resistance to that. And that's why, you know, like leading a horse by the tail is so cool. Because he's got to think about it in an area of his body that is like very unusual, right? So we do all those kinds of things, like teach them to lead by the ear, the lip, the leg, the front leg, the hind leg, all that kind of thing, and teach the horse to understand it instead of <laughs> Instead of resist or be defensive about it. And at the same time, it teaches a human how to have more feel. Because a lot of time when you watch people with horses, they kind of shove them and push them and grab the rope and pull them over here and pull them over there and shank on them. And horses just get more and more dull and more and more bracy instead of you know learning how to have more feel so that you can feel together horse feels for you instead of just going, oh, I'm just going to get pushed around. So this, you know, when you have the understanding of steady pressure, um, it, it, most of your problems are over. Most horses have a very inappropriate response to pressure, steady pressure or rhythmic pressure. And that, that leads us over to the idea of rhythmic pressure and, um, which is driving me. But, the, the idea here, I think at any point in time, uh, you can get a little bit hung up on semantics. And what's important to, to register on is that when we're asking a human to discern between the touch of, are you touching hair? Are you touching skin? Are you touching muscle? Are you touching bone? Um, I used to work with a man from the Spanish riding school named Colin Folca, who was uh, really quite a genius with horses and with the ability to look at horses and figure out which exercises would help get which muscles going and get the horse into a better balance. And one of the exercises he would do with us was um, put his hand at the edge of our spur, and, and we had to say, by applying the spur, when we were touching his skin, 
when we were touching his muscles, when we were reaching between the muscles, and um, we didn't call it bone, we called it between the muscles. <laughs> then bone his hand. <laughs> but um, it was it was just so interesting to me when when I met Pete and he gave me this description and I thought this is I mean Carl did this with us and he did this with us with rain contact and he did it with spur contact and it's this. Yeah, and you know, there's a lot of people that do this naturally. That's why we call it natural horsemanship, because it's how you naturally horses before anybody told you what to do. You know, when you were a kid and you just communicated with your horse, a lot of us get away from that. We start having riding lessons and rules. Never walk behind your horse. Don't do this. Do that. And suddenly the feel goes out of it. You just become this mechanical thing with a horse. And so, um, when we call it natural horsemanship, we need to try and appeal to the horse's natural needs of nature and then to get people to do more naturally. Because we can be perfectly intelligent and walk like a normal person, and then we get a horse and we leave our brain at the gate and we can't even walk properly with a horse. Right? So, like, how do you be more natural? A lot of people think natural horsemanship means, you know, that you don't believe in shoes or bits and you don't shave your armpits. <laughs> it's hippie horsemanship. That's not what natural horsemanship. A lot of people have kind of defined it a bit more like that. It's Western or it's trail. But really what we're trying to show you here is that it's psychology and it's communication and you can use that for anything. But we're gonna, I'm going to play a driving game. That, um, I'll do a driving game while you talk. Okay. okay. The so we're just going to have a horse do, around. That was simulated here when she was doing porcupine game is um, we would bring the horse's head down at what what was basically cannon height and do flexions left and right and then bring them to chest height and do flexions left and right and then raise their head so that the pole was flat and the throat latch was open and flex them left and right and and we went through that on the ground before we would ride in order to supple the horse and in order to establish feel for the horse and um, so again when I was watching all of these things and watching what the horses were doing, I, it, I just kept flashing back on my training with Carl and thinking, it's the same. It's it's the same, but this has a little bit of a more organized um, methodology for the general public, if you will. But it, I mean, it's something we can all do. You don't have to be with a high dollar horse and a curb bit. So those are all games of rhythmic energy and pressure. So if I you know, want a horse to get out of my way, I should be able to do things like this and have them move out and not be scared. And rhythmic pressure is how you hold boundaries as well as teach a horse to respond to energy. <coughs> if a horse was running loose, you wouldn't go, loose horse. Right? You'd be going, <coughs> right? there'd be some rhythm and energy there. You know, that will stop the horse rather than just like, whoa, I'm gonna run over the top of you. So understanding how and when to use rhythmic energy is a big piece of this. And you know, horses do that all the time. They respond to energy. You've seen horses like move that foot, or I'm gonna bite you, right? Horses do that to each other. You better move your Front end, or I'll bite you, right? It's perfectly natural for horses to understand that. But when humans do it to horses and horses get scared, <laughs> you bit me, and horses get scared, it's because they don't trust, right? So that's why I need friendly game. It's because they don't trust the human. I don't want my horse to be scared of me. Right? Everything now he's gonna respect me if I go move that, then he better move it. And not because he's like oh, scary, right? Ready for game number four? I believe so. Okay, so um, in the first three games, that's the alphabet. Now these are like patterns, the foundational patterns that will then lead to just about anything you want to teach a horse, no matter what discipline. And we'll show you more of that also when we arrive. So the yo-yo game. Is what a lot of people blame for other for. 
Is that possible for the Buddhists, right? And I see no uh, reason for it. Well, when a horse is uh, difficult to manage or he's aggressive, the best thing you can do is have him over there. It's very hard for a horse to bite you when he's over there. But most of the time, we have horses right up next to us, and we wrestle with them, and then you know, horses pretty quickly figure out that we're the weak ones, right? And, and we can get into a lot of trouble. So having that ability to influence a horse that far away from you is really powerful. And then with the actual yo-yo game, it's balancing forwards and backwards, north and south. Can he go backwards ready to come forwards? Can he come forwards ready to go backwards? Because a lot of horses are not ready to do anything, except only go forward, except stand still. So this now starts to equalize that forwards and backwards. And you can do it in lots of different ways. Linda, um, one thing there just that I'm going to talk to these guys about is the longitudinal balance of the horse along the spine. That when you see jazz back up like that and then come forward, does a tremendous amount for rotating the pelvis. And this is a very big deal in our dressage training because we want to lengthen and elongate the muscles of the top line and engage the hind end. So when a horse can step back evenly, we first see that get introduced at second level competitively, but um, it gets introduced earlier in order to develop the muscling. The, the whole intention is you're laying the groundwork for the muscles that will engage at the high end of the scale when you start to piop. So, so this, as he steps back and is able to rotate his pelvis, lift his withers, and stay straight, keeping his body equal with both legs, the side step back is even on both sides. Um, it's quite an advanced dressage exercise that you're yeah. doing there. Little girl. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll see it also, you know, riding that 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 same equality of, you know, ready to go, ready to slow. And I still remember that horse, Regalo, that made me go to a cowboy for advice. You know, we had no equality. It was go, 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 gone. Right? And I used to say that this was a walk. This was a trot, this was a canter, this was a runaway. I had to hold him back into his gates, and it was just a mess. I never thought that a horse could control himself. And that's what impulsion is, is control forward energy. But they, it's emotional, mental and emotional control, not just physical thing. And I remember seeing Regalo cantering in the pasture and stopping, and I go, why can't he do that with me? <laughs> Crazy. So clean? Yeah. All right. So the yo-yo game, you know, you get the active hind leg equalizing north and south. And then Yanni was doing nice. Yeah. Such a nervous wreck, you cannot believe. So now the circling game is a game of responsibility. So it's not lunging in any way, shape, or form. Because even though I may start to use this, you know, to get him fitter and, and all the, benefit, the gymnastic benefits of lunging, the whole idea of our circling game is the responsibility for the partnership. It's my responsibility to stand here and direct you and then leave you alone when you do what you're supposed to do. And now it's your job to maintain gait, maintain direction, and look where you're going. And if the horse disappears on the right but does not reappear on the left, then you know he stopped. Right? So when he stops, I'm just going to remind him you should be trotting. And whether I want walk, trot, canter, it doesn't matter. And if I change anything, like if I say come closer, come on a smaller circle, he should maintain gait. That's his job to do it, not for you to keep going. Pop, 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 pop. There's nothing worse than having a horse that you have to keep pushing every stride, or that you have to hold back every stride. How do you do everything beautiful? <coughs> You're wrestling with that. But most of us don't know. We say, oh, it's a hot horse. Oh, it's a lazy horse. Oh, therefore, you know, we make up for all these things with the way the horse is 
not going rather than teach them, that's your job. Trot until further notice, no matter what I do. We have a little abscess on its um, heel quarter, so every now and then it might show up a little bit. So if I keep walking, it doesn't matter where I go, he goes, doesn't engage, my job to keep trotting. If I ask him to change directions, then he should keep trotting. And so again, this is all what the circling game is about. And the, the circling game in terms of um, the gymnastic <laughs> for the horse, uh, I would say in the dressage world, we modify it a lot. We, we keep large circles. We're a little bit anxious about horses on this small of a circle, um, especially for a prolonged period of time. But the, the basic concept done in short amounts is that the horse can be attentive, he can be attentive to go, he can maintain it himself. But um, that's a, it's a tricky one in, in my melding of the languages. Um, I just, when, when people say, oh, that's really people, they trot their horses forever on the tiny circle. I'm like, well, I don't. <laughs> yeah, and you I, shouldn't. You know, yeah. You shouldn't. It's, um, you, you can balance it. You can balance what they need to learn, and you can reward it when they do it, and it doesn't have to go on forever. Yeah. So the same way teaching a horse to pirouette doesn't have to go on forever. So, um, they, you know, it gets smaller, it gets larger. And when you have a larger rope, you can put them out on a larger circle as well. Yeah, we and can these like other foot lines and 45 foot lines. Exactly. Like, this is just where you start and then you go out from there. Right. And that's, that's part of the beauty of it is the horses start becoming calm about it instead of just getting out on the end of a rope and flipping out, which is, unfortunately, a lot of what you see, especially at different breed shows and so on, where you know people are lunging, uh, lunging down or whatever, and there's no balance involved, there's no thought involved. It's just um, a, an adrenaline expression. So this is very useful for just getting that, again, the calmness, the relationship, the focus, and it, it doesn't have to go on and on and on. No, none of them should. Mm -hmm. That's why there's seven games, and yeah. not one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, people get their favorite thing and then they just do it today. And that's not necessarily the principle. Game number six, sideways? Yeah. So this is about um, equalizing right and left, and having the horse be straight through his body, as straight this as possible. Obviously, a leg yoke, obvious for for such people. And this is again where you can play with degrees. The degree of angle in sideways game can be like what Jazz is doing right now for a classical leg yoke, or it can be made stronger which makes it a stronger exercise for its hindquarters there. And then she can bring his shoulders ahead again to take some of the pressure off. So, so getting them to understand how to respond and separate their shoulder from their hip, unify the shoulder and the hip. Um, I, I would say Courtney's horse isn't acting exactly like a PTA anymore. <laughs> so, we're seeing fairly accomplished examples of this that are pretty far up the line. And um, breaking it down into the simple and the start is the part that I find so useful for warming up, warming up muscles, and um, <laughs> getting the horse's understanding. Believe it or not, that's up. actually cool that he argues now. He never used to argue at all. So there's all kinds of ways to do sideways. Um, and then, you know, you don't have to get to these kind of levels to do dressage. You need, you know, you just need to know what you need to know for what you want to do. My husband has cutting horses and so 
<laughs> and what we do um, is I, I use those exercises with an eye toward are they symmetric? Am I getting the same size step to the left as I'm getting to the right? I'm not worried about doing it quickly. I'm worried about, again, the suppleness, the reach, the, the balance of the horse, and, and seeing the horse understand and being able to execute this equivalently on both sides of their body. And when we do it fast, like I'll, I'll do at least once a week a fast sideways move, and that's to develop his motional fitness. Because a lot of the time when the adrenaline comes up, comes up in a horse, they go crazy. Because the only time horses get on adrenaline is when they're afraid, you know, they're going to be eaten, or when they're mad and they're fighting. And so when they, the adrenaline comes up and we're asking them to perform more, that feels negative to them. So we have to get them to understand the positive effects of adrenaline, not just the negative. And one of the easiest ways to do that is without going straight ahead, because they can go really fast going straight ahead. But sideways, they have to think in order to cross their legs. And we don't do it very far, but it's just bring that adrenaline up and then see how we can just go, whoop, no big deal, right? Normally adrenaline comes up and they're fizzy till I get to the stall, right? And, and that's not positive either. So and the last final. game, the last game is the squeeze game. And the squeeze game is to help horses with claustrophobia. And so we ask them to pass through a narrow space and it starts like this, but then it can become, you know, getting into a trailer, it has to do with jumps, ditches, water, all that kind of thing. And I will see how he's eagerly going to that space. We want them to go, oh, there's a little space, let me in it. Whereas most horses go, little space, run away. Right, because horses shouldn't be in little spaces, that's how they get killed and eaten. And so, let's say that I want to get him to go around behind this mounting block. That's a tiny little space. That most horses are afraid of. So we teach them how to be brave about things like that. And we wouldn't ask them to do stupid or unsafe things, but we keep working on their ability to get over their claustrophobic tendencies. And a lot of people don't think about claustrophobia in terms of contact and collection and precision riding, but it's a very claustrophobic situation for horses. Even horses that don't want to go in corners, that's a claustrophobic problem. It's not, my horse is stupid. Or he doesn't like corners. Well, yeah, he doesn't like corners. But why does he like corners? You know, because he's afraid of them. It's a trap. So horses are terrified of traps, and we've got to help them learn that everything that we're doing with them is not a trap, is not going to harm them. And some horses take a lot of convincing. So, squeeze game is about <coughs> compression. Enjoy compression. Don't worry about it. Seek the space. Don't run away from it. And that does come in unbelievably handy when you're in a tight spot between C and the judge, and um, having to get your horse through that little spot. Some horses find that that's a tight spot, having the judge back there and just having to stay on the track at C. So um, regardless, it's, it's a useful exercise and a useful thing to be able to recognize um, for the horse to realize that there's an answer and a way out. And that was one of the things that I really appreciated about the process of watching the seven games evolve in the horse's body and in their mind is that the, the problem solving aspect of this, what, what I found is then the horses start, instead of always being told what to do and, and always just layering on one more answer and one more answer, they start to feel like a participant, and they start to think. And then when they realize that they have the right to think, it's like what Linda was saying earlier, that, that Jazz actually talked back to her a little bit, um, it, it adds to their character, it adds to their confidence, and um, it gives them an understanding that if they study it, they'll find the answer. And that, that was just fascinating to me with my horses, a number of which were, you know, advanced horses. And um, just feeling the change, I understand, when I um, started to incorporate the, the thinking 
of the games was, oh, you know, any, any request is a question, and if the horse is confident that he can find the answer, you just, it's, it's really fun. And if they're worried that they can't find the answer, that's when adrenaline comes up and the escape route gets taken. And I was good at riding when they were on the escape route, so I just figured that was part of horses. <laughs> the great thing, too, is like, if he's going to be a bit sassy like that, I'd like to see that on the ground, not when I'm on him, right? So that's where you work it out, and there's a little bit of you know, playfulness or freshness or whatever. Let's figure that out on the ground where you can have some fun and I don't get parked off and mucked out. And then once you're like, oh, hey, I feel good and I want to be... <laughs> I want to be with you now. That's when you get on. Perfect. So saddling is a friendly game. And I remember Pat saying, if, if, if you have to cross tie your horse and you can't put the rope on the ground and saddle your horse and have him stand still, you've got a problem. And I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> I mean, I have to cross tie my horse and he's still got away from me when I tried to saddle him. He would like, duck down and try to get out of it. He hated it. <laughs> and a lot of horses hate saddles for two reasons. One is that they pinch them and they're too tight. And the other one is that it's a trap. So when, when a saddle is tight on a horse um, and restricted, that's a trap. And it affects horses mentally, emotionally, not just physically. Same thing with the bit. And you have a horse where he wants to bridle himself. When I met Pat, I used to stand on a bucket to bridle my horse. Yeah. When we had to put bridles on in the clinic, he said, teach your horse to put his head down. I'm like, why was that not obvious? <laughs> <laughs> I spent the whole time, with, you know, and I'd get boxes and things to stand on to bridle my horse. Because common sense is very uncommon, right? And, and it's monkey see, monkey do. You see people wrestling with horses all the time, and you think, well, that's just what, what horses are like. We were at um, a stable not so long ago, and they had these huge draft horses. And um, the guy said, you know, would you like to see this and that, and such and such? And we said, great. So he got a bridle out. His horse, and he was a tall guy. His horse is like 18-2. And he's trying to shove the bit in the horse's mouth. And Pat just looked at me and was like, we have a lot of work to do still. You know, to just help people understand how we can be more natural and more practical with horses. So all these things aren't a problem. And it's like, well, once I get you all tacked up, then we're ready to train. No, you're training your horse the moment he sees you. <coughs> he's already forming opinions and making plans. And how can you make sure they're good ones? So same thing when it comes to the the bridle and the bit. I want my horse to have a positive opinion of those. That when he feels the bit, he doesn't go ah, like that. So we teach him to to reach down into the bit instead of avoid it. If he feels it, don't argue. Down. Now, when I'm sitting on him and I pick up the bridle, then he'll sit to my hand instead of away from it. So there are all those little things that when you start thinking differently, you go, oh, how can I change my horse's opinion about that? How can I make it something more positive? And then with sticks. I had a dog, and every time somebody said, oh, my horse doesn't do sticks. Horses aren't afraid of sticks. If the stick's on the ground, they'll go stomp on it. They're afraid of the attitude on the end of it. And that's why, you know, looking for more cookies. That's why, you know, all of our extensions of our appendages need to be friendly. But this is not something a horse does to you know, hurt me with it, you know, terrorize me. It's actually quite hard to hurt a horse, but it's very easy to terrorize it. Uh, 
And then I'll just run through the subheadings. Mm -hmm. And so, oops. So these are things that we teach our horses to, is to be a partner, and when you stand up on a mounting block, that they come over to you. A lot of the time you see people following horses with mounting blocks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now he's moved, I've got to be better there. <laughs> when you can teach a horse to come to you, it's amazing the difference. And it's not just the convenience of it, but it's the fact that the horse goes, yeah, come on, get on. If a horse is stepping away from you, this he's trying to tell you something. He's like, no, 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 I don't want you up there. Right? So, Sarah, you said this in your pamphlet as well, that um, this t teaches the human as much as it teaches the horse. Mm -hmm. And it does. You know, some people are really natural with horses, but they can't tell you how to do it. And that's what we've made a living doing, is teaching people things other people don't teach us. Right? They go, what's wrong with you? Why can't you just, right? So we've broken it down into that simple language where you can communicate with your horse. So mounting is a friendly game. My horse should be able to stand still when you get on. Cordy had a breakthrough yesterday. He got on him and he didn't want to run off. Today. Well, it was today. Morning. You would go and put a foot in the stirrup and he was gone. And people go, oh, he can't stand still, he's really high spirited. My husband is high spirited, he can stand still. <laughs> <laughs> so, just sitting on my horse is a friendly game. Right? He shouldn't feel threatened by me, by my staff, by my movements. As long as I'm relaxed, he should be relaxed. And we teach them that, you know, at first, you might only be able to rub them, and then it moves to being able to rub them with your legs, and then it moves to being able to rub them with your stick and move things around, and swing a rope and catch a cow, and, right? Not going to address ourselves. <laughs> so that's a friendly game. If I ask my horse to do lateral flexion, which is I might need in an emergency to stop my horse one day, I'm going to teach him now that when I bend him like this, which is the most vulnerable position for a horse to be in, that he can relax. Because one day he might get startled by something and I have to go, <gasps> don't run off of me. And I don't want him going on now, the tiger's got me too. Right? He's learned how to relax with that. So now with steady pressure, can my horse respond to steady pressure anywhere on his body? If I use my leg, you can pull that forward, but it shouldn't. If I use one leg, that does not mean go forward. That means yield. And you can see this response to this when on the ground. That's where I teach it. And then I keep doing that once I'm on it. If I wanted to go from my seat, no legs, no kicking, nothing like that. Moving off of my seat. I go, me and the saddle are going forward. And now me and the saddle are stopping. And he goes, I don't know why, but I feel like stopping. The bit is going backwards. Can he move off the reins? Lightly. Now I've got a car that works. But most horses you do that with, they, they don't move, or it takes a lot. You have to kick them, spur them, push them. You don't have that fluidness. And it's a conversation. He understands what it means. There's no brace, there's no resistance. Nothing like that. So that's porcupine game. And we call it porcupine game because the goal is don't lean. And you would never lean on a porcupine quill, right? So we have to teach the horses that concept. The spur is just a porcupine quill. Right? So we teach horses not to lean on it. Don't just yield. Don't lean, be light, be soft. Then when it comes to energy, can I use rhythmic pressure and have my horse understand that that means go backwards? 
Well, can I use rhythmic pressure with my stick? And that means go forwards. Can I use rhythmic pressure and turn here? And a lot of people go, oh, what's that got to do with dressage? Well, if your bridle fell off and your rein broke, you'd probably quite like to have this going on. If you go, oh my god, my rein broke! <coughs> Whoa! So there are your basic three games. Now, the yo yo game. So I'm using steady pressure there with my seat. And now I'm using steady pressure with my belly button. And my belly button is being attached to the bit. And so if I go forward, you should go forward. Be ready when you're going forward to go backwards. I don't want to pull your lips off. And I don't want to ask you to go forward. And you're, you're going, eh, nah, not today. Maybe a little spooky. So instead of just pushing it through it, I'm going to play the friendly game and go, don't worry, you're with me, you're safe, everything's fine. So every transition is a, is a part of the yo-yo game. Can I walk as easily as I can trot? Can I trot as easily as I can walk? Can he feel that in my body? Can I stop? And then can I trot? Can I stop? Can I let go of everything? Is he calm, but responsive? Because a lot of times you get a horse that is that sharp, that responsive, and you can't drop the rein because their adrenaline's up. So that's the yo-yo game. So when I do transitions, I don't think about the transition, I think about the equalization. Because some horses are better at downward transitions than upward transitions, even vice versa, right? Mm -hmm. You ever experienced that? Downward transitions, no, nah, not going to happen. Upward transitions, no. Nah. What's wrong with this walk? Right? So if you think about equality and you play it as a yo-yo game, then your transitions <coughs> get better. Anything to add? Okay. Alright, so now, circling game. You know, I can put my horse on a circle and go, alright, it's your job to stay on the circle. I'm not going to keep pushing and pulling you. Right? He goes, oh, circling game, got it. And he's got to keep maintaining gait. I'm not pushing every step. If I quit, he should quit. Right? So, in that harmony word that you talked about, that's what we're looking for, that the horse is an extension of us. That doesn't just happen. I mean, you can buy a Grand Prix trained horse and all of a sudden you just say, like, he's gonna do exactly what I ask him. Most of the time I have no clue if I, that I have done that. So, on the circling game, yes, one part of it is the, um, you know, being able to stay on a circle, maintain direction, but now the part of maintaining gait becomes really, really valuable in your dressage. And um, he's not very warmed up really physically, but we'll just do a little bit so you can see it. So, I shouldn't have to ask him to keep going or to not go so fast. He should be right with me. And thinking about maintaining gait, so if I'm going to ask him to walk as slow as he can, he's still in walk, he's as slow as I can possibly walk. But he's still thinking walk is my job, not make me walk every step. Same thing if I trot. But now he should, he should maintain that trot. Sorry about that walk. And so if I want to speed the trot up, or I want to slow it down, I shouldn't have to push it. You should be going, my job to trot, my job to trot, because a trot, you're going to do something. 
you should be trotting. You should be trotting. I'm not going to keep pushing you. That's your job. And now you've got him mentally thinking about it instead of just physically doing it. He's like, oh, my job to trot, or my job to canter, no matter where I put him, what shape, how fast, how slow. And then I just tell him where I want him to go. justice to anything um, to pretend that you don't know how to integrate your aids. And, and so what Linda just demonstrated is a concept, but that's a concept with years of work and training that have gone into it. Yeah. And, and again, I just have to say it would be um, not honest to pretend that anybody without any training in their body could get on, and if their horse understands circling game, they're going to be able to do everything from a collected trot to half steps to uh, baby massage because they taught their horse circling game. It's not going to work like that. Okay. No, it's, it's like going to wrong three. Just, just you know, yeah. in the interest of yeah. honesty here, I don't want to be called. <laughs> well, I couldn't do that thing yet tomorrow. Okay. All right. And, and the, the place where anything um, becomes complicated, whether you're talking about seven games or whether you're talking about any style of riding, is the integration. The integration of your legs, seat and rein, the, the understanding of the feeling of the balance, um, what it is that you want from a horse at any particular point in time. And um, I'm just saying from the, the dressage end, we are um, very picky about the progression with which exercises are introduced because of the awareness of how developed the hind legs have to get and how hard we're trying to develop the horses equally on both sides of their body. And um, we're very anxious not to um, ask too hard of a question before the muscles have warmed up enough to make that a fair question. And um, what, I, what I like about the progression of the games is when you're doing it on a more beginner state, Linda has been able to very quickly move jazz into <coughs> really advanced answers, which again, I'm just saying you have to be a little bit careful because those are advanced questions with advanced answers with the horse who's been trained and he ha obviously has the muscles developed to do it. But it's very, very important that you allow those muscles to develop and you allow them to get formed. Um, and that's how you reach the degree of response that you can expect. So um, there's, there's a lot going on here that we couldn't, I mean, nobody could talk fast enough to talk about everything that's going on. But I just want to acknowledge it. Yeah. I mean, this, this isn't simple. But once, once, you once you have the language, right? right? Once you have the language, you know, then at least you have a way to go, oh, well, that makes sense, now I have to refine it. I often think about it as a Rosetta Stone, like when you learn a, a language. Um, and dressage has it perfectly in the levels, right? Okay? Exactly. Each level just builds your skills and your vocabulary and, you know, to a very high level. And we have the same thing in the foundation of just speaking the horse language. And, you know, there's a lot of people who, well, my husband doesn't do what I do, but I don't do what he does when it comes to the Western and the cutting and the raining and all that kind of thing. But it's the same language. He's just speaking, you know, having that conversation. Right. And so that's where the seven games comes in is it's your conversation, it's your language, it's not the thing, right? A lot of people have made natural horsemanship a discipline, and we never think of it as a discipline. We think of that as a foundation and a bridge. Right. Yeah. And that's where it's invaluable. Well, because again, it gets the horse to access the parts of their body, it gets them to understand that they can come up with an answer, it allows the rider to 
I think, realize that you're asking questions and looking for an answer and recognizing it when you get it. Yeah. And, um, you know, we talk a lot about feel, and the, the feeling of balance is that feel. It's, that's the end goal. So again, what you just illustrated with jazz is a very educated, very balanced, very much in tune and harmonious demonstration. Um, but it's been built on for years, and years of training as a writer and for the horse. And that's why I like it. <laughs> that's why I like massage. It's hard. But you know, it's a very sophisticated language, and I've finally got something I can refine. Thank you, Pat. Yeah. <laughs> because before that, really, it was a form of horse wrestling. And now, you know, I feel like I have more of a, a language and a way to discuss things with my horse. And if he, if I make a mistake or he doesn't understand, instead of punishing him, I have a way to sort it out and negotiate rather than just go, hey, hey. because he probably had no idea. And then I turn into a predator and scold him, and horses don't understand punishment. So we have to really change the way that we think in order to get on the same page as a horse. Do any of you have questions about what you're seeing? Go ahead. Well, Tisha. You can imagine that I'm going to say something on the subject of the tools between you and your horse. <laughs> and as I look at you from here, I'm very proud to think that I could stick my whole hand in underneath his pad all along his shoulder there, and yeah. he would not be pinched, and he could therefore carry yeah. you. And there's no him. pressure squeezing behind his shoulder or restricting him in any way. These saddles are made to uh, accommodate a horse in motion rather than standing still. And you know, that's one of the things where a lot of horses have trouble with saddles, just because they're too tight, it's trapped. And it's like having something gripping on them like that. Definitely a big part of our philosophy is the equipment that we use, or that we would never use. Anyone else? Experiences? Yeah, everyone's wine. like <laughs> More wine. Yeah, <laughs> lucky ducks. I'm happy for all the reminders. Because I've done early stuff for years. Um, I, like you said, we get into our favorite little things just, this is great to bring me back. That's awesome. Thank <laughs> you for being here. And there's, I mean, I know some of you are preaching to the and some of you are very, very skilled at this. Karen Box standing in the back there, she's highly skilled in both dressage and, you know, this approach with horses. And Jesse's one of our five-star master instructors, and uh, he doesn't do dressage, but you should see him do cowboy mounted shooting with no bridle and, and wins. His horses trust him so much. And of course, he teaches all of this. And um, his cat, I don't know, not recognize some people will say their names properly, but actually, you know, Pink, of course, he's brought up together. And so, you know, again, I think the biggest misconception is that this is, you know, stuff where it's hippie horsemanship instead of it's really psychology and language. And you can, once you've got the language, you can do anything with it. But we've got to get good at that. Having successful trail rides versus riding Grand Prix is going to need, need a different vocabulary. And so then that's what I'm learning is the vocabulary of higher level dressage. And then I've got to convey that to my horse with the common ground that we already have. And so for me, the journey is not a struggle. Because I'm, I'm struggling with learning dressage, but I'm not struggling in conversing with my horse. Whereas when I went to a cowboy for advice, I was doing both. At first level. You know, didn't understand it and fighting my horse. And the horse is just going, what? So the more clarity we can give them and help them to feel safe and motivated to be with us, then you've got a calm, connected, responsive, supple, successful horse and person. Thank you very much for being here. Really
Cornie and Yanni, he was so good. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Daniela, wherever you are.